And thank you for joining us this evening and welcome to the Interroyal Scanning Tips and Tricks for Success. It's a webinar being presented by Kelly Bevington, our Director of Interoral Technology here at DSG. Um, where well, I'll read you a little bit about Kelly, where clinical education involves interoral technology. Kelly's expertise is unsurpassed. To date, her passion has led to training over 500 dentists, their staff, dental students, and AEGD residents on various intraoral scanner systems. Being professionally trained and certified on most major devices, Kelly is a leading dental expert on digital scanning, tissue retraction management, and isolation, which is imperative to obtain digital impression scans for veneers, crowns, and bridges. And with that, it is my pleasure to say, take it away, Kelly. Thanks so much, Jessica. Appreciate you coordinating the event this evening. So thank you everybody for being here. Uh, I'm excited to, I'm always excited to talk about uh, intraoral scanning. It's uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've been traveling around the country for about the last eight years conducting um, scanner trainings and am pleased to have an opportunity tonight to share with you some of the, I don't know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of what our experiences have been. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. I'm gonna work primarily from a PowerPoint presentation. I do have, I do have some like different visual aids and so forth that um, I'll address as well. And uh, yeah, so let me shift to the PowerPoint. share. Okay, and everybody can see? We can see. Awesome. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so the, tonight's uh, presentation is not scanner specific. It is generalities on what is needed to acquire um, a good, clear, accurate, usable scan. And so we will we'll go over several different items as well as a little bit about Dental Services Group. I've got some of my acronyms up here on the screen. So uh, DSG is us, Dental Services Group. Uh, digital impressioning, you'll hear a lot of uh, people speak about DI this and DI that, and that is referencing digital impressions. Intraoral scanners is uh, iOS. That, uh, that took me a little while to uh, get used to that one being uh, iOS and Apple based platforms, you know, but uh, iOS in our world and our dental world are for intraoral scanners and then uh, the digital ex experience center, excuse me, is the DXC and so the DXC is a unique uh, laboratory component that DSG has specific for intraoral scans and I'll get into a little bit more of that later so. So I, I always want to make it a point to thank the attendees and, and uh, authentically and genuinely thank them for being customers, for being DSG associates, uh, for being people that are interested in dentistry and learning more about what it is we're sharing with you this evening. So relationships matter. Uh, not just to dental services group, but certainly to me personally as well. And we really enjoy the opportunity to present these webinars and uh, sort of give back to the dental community that gives so much to us. This is an example of where we are. Some people don't even realize where dental services group labs are. So I thought it would be helpful to have a visual component of that. Um, Jessica uh, is down in uh, Florida. She's in the Clearwater area. I happen to reside in Western Pennsylvania. And as you can see by the blue dots, we have laboratories across the country with different levels of expertise uh, to assist you across the board uh, as a full service dental lab that we are. So um, we are a full service dental laboratory. And what does that mean, right? So, um, and how does it relate to intraoral scanning and tips and tricks? So any, just about any dental appliance 
or prosthetic device can be fabricated from an intraoral scan now. And that, that's just amazing to me, the, the, um, how, how the digital world has really catapulted uh, forward in just the last three to five years. So uh, it started with orthodontic appliances and uh, Invisalign uh, aligners is, is where it's sort of based from, um, then as well as restorative single unit crowns, but complete across the board now with uh, bridges, partials, implant crowns. Um, implants are like awesome to scan for, one of the easiest uh, scans we can do as well as sleep appliances and different bruxism appliances. Uh, we are now doing dentures as well. Uh, primary success is uh, scanning a wash impression inside of an existing denture versus scanning the uh, oral cavity itself. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more as well. I'm looking to see if there's any questions or anything. I don't see anything. Um, so what is digital dentistry? I decided to look this up to have an actual, uh, an actual definition. So digital dentistry is the method of gathering the data that we're going to use to plan, design, and manufacture devices, appliances that the dentist will use um, with his patients, but also as a diagnostic aid um, not only to do the dentistry, but to treatment plan or uh, present the dentistry options as well. And this is an example of some of the intraoral scanners out there today. Um, not everybody, but there are, truly there are new scanner systems coming out every other month. Um, these are the main scanner systems that we currently receive scans from every day at Dental Services Group. But as an example, like I'm doing a lot of work with people that um, have the Medit scanner now, um, and, and that didn't quite make it to my slide, but there's, uh, it's something new every day, which is part of what I really enjoy about uh, intraoral technology and what we do. So our indications, what, what can we do with the scanner, which I've, I already touched on a little bit. So anything that you can take a polyvinyl uh, siloxane impression of, you can take a digital impression of, and we can then fabricate those devices from it. So from crowns, um, implant crowns, bridges, veneers, partials, bite splints, aligners, sleep appliances, you name it, and uh, it's being done now digitally. So I like to explain to people, and, and some of you may be completely new to uh, DI, digital impressions. Others might have some experience with it. Uh, but I like to call attention, especially to, to new people, that there is a learning curve with this technology. And for, uh, I'm gonna say for people under the age of 30, it comes at a quicker pace than what you'll see here on the screen. Um, but in most cases, it takes people about 20 scans before they really feel confident with the technology and what they're doing. So we, we refer to um, you know, the time of purchase as the, the user or the buyer being an unconscious, incompetent user, uh, meaning they really don't know what they're doing and what they are doing, they're not particularly doing it well. So the, the user themselves is not uh, necessarily aware of that until they go to use it themselves. And so one of the things I really encourage people to do when they're investigating systems is to try to do some sort of a hands-on demonstration so that they can touch it, they can feel it, they can check out the ergonomics of it. How is this footprint going to work in their particular operatories? What is the manufacturer's recommendation for positioning yourself as a user to the patient? 
And what I mean by that is um, some scanner companies recommend that you sit directly behind the patient, more at like a 12 o'clock position. So you're, you're scanning with the device like this, and this is the patient's head. Um, others, you're going to be more at like a nine o'clock position and from a side view. So why that's important is it makes a different difference in your hand-eye coordination and how you are going to uh, view indirectly the monitor screen itself. Sort of like driving in a rear view mirror for some people for, a, for this learning curve period of time. So it's important to, um, to, to evaluate that and it's also important to take advantage of the manufacturer's training that is most often offered with the purchase of the device. So I, I know many, 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 many people that have opted out of the training, um, even though it was included with the purchase price of their scanner, they, yeah, they think they can watch some YouTube videos and, and get a handle on it pretty quickly. And, and maybe they can do a full art scan with relative ease by, by um, omitting the, the training session, but then they go to do something a little more in depth, like scanning for a crown, and using some of the features and tools that, that are specific to their scanner system. And that's where they can get stuck. And they're, they're not aware of all of the wonderful features that their particular scanner has. So uh, we, that's where we come in. And we try to get you up to speed as, qu as quickly as possible. Um, however, if you have a little bit of foundation um, to reference it and, and even like know where some of the icons are, then we can really uh, sort of delve in deep and help educate you on the optimal ways to use the features and tools that your individual scanner has. So once you're, um, once you're at like that one to five scan uh, period in your experience, Certainly your, your skill set is going to increase, your competence is going to increase. I usually recommend to people um, to sort of time themselves, uh, whether it's by like a minute or seconds of time, um, or image size, um, file size, or image count rather, uh, file size. Different scanners have different, um, different modes or different ways of measuring your effectiveness. And why that's important is it will, it will make the submission process of the scan uh, much faster and uh, easier for you to manipulate the, the data. So somewhere between five and 15 scans, this is where I really, really encourage um, a practice that has multiple dental assistants that will be using the device to really um, hone in on who it is coming naturally to. Who can you assign to be that champion in the practice to um, not, not really manage the, the scanner per se, but to be a mentor and help the others in the practice who might be struggling a little bit, um, guide them through the process. Um, for and there's there's always somebody there's always someone that it just it comes more naturally to um, it, it's almost uh, second nature by the time they get to their fifth or tenth scan and and that's the person you really you want to befriend and uh, and work with that person give them appropriate kudos and congratulations and and treat them like they're something special because they are uh, and they will be able to help uh, educate and develop new people as they come on board as well. And, and in doing that, it, it's also important to provide uh, adequate time for them to, to do that um, education or, or sharing of their knowledge. And the thing that's really gonna make the biggest difference is practice. I, I'm sure all of us have heard that all of our lives as we are learning new skills, but practice really does make perfect. The more you do it, the more, um, 
the more automatic it comes to your brain. And then somewhere around that 20 case mark, um, you've got it. it. It is second nature. You understand it clearly. You're, you're probably scanning every day. It's, um, it's something you're enjoying. You're understanding all the different tools. And now as that, uh, that user, you can, um, you've got the skill set now that you can uh, educate others about it. So I'm going to review some basic um, items and some items that are important to follow from your manufacturer protocols, whether you currently have a scanner um, and, and might be hearing some of these things for the first time, or if you're investigating uh, purchasing a scanner, uh, these are some things to uh, keep in mind. So every scanner is different um, and, and that's difficult for people to hear sometimes. They think, oh, well, scanning is scanning. Well, yeah, sort of like driving is driving, you know, but driving a, a, a sedan versus a motorcycle versus a quad versus a tractor trailer is different, right? They're, they're all different modes of transportation. So we have lots of different modes of scanning and each system is uh, unique. Each system is unique in what they have to offer and the tools that they have to offer. So um, it's important to understand which arch are you supposed to scan first, especially if you had scanning experience in one office and, and, and perhaps now you're in a different office. Um, maybe you're an associate in a practice or maybe you're a dental assistant or a hygienist in a practice. And now the owner has brought in different technology. They're not all the same. So it's important to pay attention and to learn about your particular device, your particular intraoral scanner. So which arch are you gonna scan first? Um, can the bite registration be taken prior to tooth preparation? That's my favorite. Not all scanners can you take the bite registration first. Um, however, if you can, uh, such as TRIOS is an example where you can take the bite reg first, I highly recommend taking the bite registration before the patient is anesthetized and to take that bite registration while they are sitting up, while the, the, when you tell them to close, that their natural bite feels natural versus when they're upside down on their head and numb and they're trying to put their teeth together. And then we wonder sometimes as labs and as dentists, why the occlusion's off, you know? It, it's just, that, that's like a real common sense item for me. Um, so the other thing to really pay attention to is referred to as scan path strategies. And what that is, is how you're starting in the arch and how you're finishing, like what direction do they want you to go? Um, typically, it's going to be, for a quadrant, it's going to be occlusal lingual buckle, but not all the time with all devices. So it's important to understand your device and what that scan path protocol or those scanning strategies are. Um, protect the camera lens of your device. It is the most valuable uh, piece of your scanner and it's I'm, I'm consistently amazed when I go into especially large dental practices, large clinics, um, dental schools that the scanner is is sitting there without the without the the uh, tip on it. And I'm looking to see if I have one handy. I would grab it. I am just a second. So as an example, I'm going to keep talking. This happens to be a trio scanner, right? So here's the trio scanner, and oftentimes I go into practices. And it's sitting like this. So I'm not sure if you can see the glass tip, right? So that's glass. That's going to break. It's going to scratch um, if it gets bumped or moved at all. So there's always a protective tip to keep on your scanner, no matter what kind it is. All the scanners have, uh, all but one, have um, protective tips that you want to make sure are kept on the scanner itself. It will help to protect the investment of your device. 
Uh, what's something else? Um, in generality, please avoid using cotton rolls. Cotton rolls are like the enemy of the scanner. What happens is you put them in the, in the buckle corridor, and then when you go to rotate the scanner buckly, that cotton roll is in the way, and you can't get a real nice parallel view of the buckle surface of the two structure of that preparation or lingual, you know, same thing on the lingual if you place a cotton roll on the lingual. Um, so instead of doing that, oftentimes people will take uh, a two by two gauze and, and sort of roll it up or mush it up and, and put it sublingually to help push the tongue out of the way. If it's a sponge type two by two, uh, that works good. Um, However, if it's a real fibrous two by two, not so good because what happens is those little fibers from the cotton rolls and from the two by twos actually um, interfere with the scan quality of the image. We can see the fibers on it. Um, and, and sometimes it's difficult to remove that from the scan itself. Uh, if your particular device has an option to take a high, defini high definition image of the prep, please take advantage of having that feature. It's such a wonderful feature. Uh, some scanners, it will be called a high resolution or high def image, high def photo. Others, it might be called a zoom feature. Uh, but if your device has it, take advantage of it. It's a, pardon me, it's a quick snapshot. Um, typically right of the occlusal of the prep. And it just is, a, is another image uh, for the laboratory technicians to utilize when marking the margins of your particular restoration. So I'm gonna start with some basics. And uh, for me, you know, and, and I'll wear my, my lab hat now. Um, is occlusion, right? And we wanna make sure that as uh, the dentist or the assistant supporting the dentist, that there was enough occlusal reduction done uh, that is adequate for the type of restoration that doctor is prescribing. So many, many times um, I ask the question, you know, so, Doctor, uh, what, are, what do you use to ensure you have enough occlusal reduction? And usually they say, oh, my eyes. Well, eh, you know, our eyes are good, but our eyes can play tricks on us as well. Uh, so there's lots of different devices and tools out there. Some are very economical, some you're going to invest a little bit of uh, money into it, but there's something called rubber bite tabs. Did not have an example of that, but I, I think most dentists uh, know what that is. It's, it's uh, measured in millimeters. You have the patient bite into it, and as long as you can pull the tab through, you know you have enough uh, reduction. Some people will use a perio probe or a ball burnisher. Uh, my personal favorite is the image on the screen. It's called Prep Check. Uh, it's a little rubber tab. It comes in three different um, measurements, usually 1.5 is, is what I will take with me into a practice. And if it leaves a mark, like articulation paper, if it leaves a mark on the prep itself, that means that in that area where it's marked, you do not have sufficient occlusal reduction. So you can go ahead and adjust that before you ever, here's the keyword, before you ever take the scan or a physical impression also. So um, could you just go ahead and scan it anyway? Well, yeah, you could. And find this out after the fact because most of the scanners today have some sort of an occlusal um, check view. It, it's a feature, it's a tool on the scanner. And it's great that it has that, but wouldn't you rather know that ahead of time instead of having to go backwards, reprep the tooth and then rescan the at least the prep itself in all cases at least the prep itself um, and at that point then you know maybe hemostasis becomes an issue maybe isolation becomes an issue um, so foundations right let's make sure that we have proper occlusal reduction before uh, taking our digital impression 
So here are some examples of isolation tools, right? How do we keep the lips and cheek and tongue out of the way so that we can acquire good data of the dentition? So there's uh, several different items. Um, I'm actually gonna start with, I don't know if you can see my cursor. So when I go into practices, I usually take an Otrogate um, because it's a unidose, it's, it's uh, disposable. It comes in uh, multiple sizes. Many offices already have them for orthodontic work, orthodontic uh, photography and so forth. Um, if you don't like the idea of having something disposable, the comfort view, the one on the bottom uh, right hand side of your screen, is autoclavable. Um, it's, it appears to be quite comfortable for the patients and uh, it, it works very nicely as well. If you are, if there are two people um, in the operatory chair side when scanning, then I really like the one here in the top center, which is called the ScanMate. And um, I'll get some of my visual aids out, right? So the ScanMate is autoclavable and it's bendable. So see how the head bends and the rubber tip is very flexible. So when you're pulling against the you know, tender uh, tissues of the oral cavity or tongue or under the tongue, it's, it's quite comfortable for the patient. Again, if you were scanning by yourself, would not necessarily recommend it, but if a doctor is scanning with an assistant and the assistant can use this to help retract the lips, cheek, especially in an anterior um, scan for you know, veneers or something, I think this would work really, really beautifully. So um, along with isolation, we want to control the saliva. So moisture control, as well as, um, you know, isolating the, the tongue and the lips and the cheek. So there are um, two, two items here on the screen and show them to you as well. So the one on the left, most practices have these. They are, um, dry angles or cotton dry angles are pretty absorbent. You can sort of bend it. Can you see how I bent it? Almost like a little taco. And then you can slide it in against the tongue and it helps to retract the tongue a little bit uh, so that you can get those lingual images with your scanner. You can also use it, I would not bend it, you could also use it um, against the inside of the cheek, against that carotid gland. Um, to, uh, to absorb the, the moisture from that parotid gland. And this is cotton on both sides. We don't want the one with the foil. Oftentimes offices will have the one with the foil and they're like, oh, well, I'll just flip it around backwards. Well, now the foil is against the parotid gland and it's not gonna soak up any saliva uh, that way. So they're super economical for a giant bag. Um, the other one, NeoDry, and most, um, most uh, distributors have their own brand uh, as well. Um, so that's a, a view of that. And it's sort of perforated. I'm not sure what the material is inside, but it's similar to uh, like a baby diaper and it just swells with the saliva. Um, so I, that's, this is my go-to all the time. I put it against the inside of the cheek before I ever start to scan. And what happens is when you're pulling against the cheek, you're, you're milking that parotid gland and, and it, so it, it, saliva is coming out of it. And oftentimes people will be scanning and they're like, where is the saliva coming from, you know? And that can be one of the culprits. So um, just a, a, a couple little items that are my personal go-tos. So here is an example of some scans. Um, from the lab, right, that we have, and they, there was an opportunity for improvement is the best way to put it. So the one in the upper left is in color, the, the other one is in the monochromatic or the stone, which, which we toggle back and forth to identify margins, to mark the margins, but you can see some discrepancies pretty, pretty clearly there that I, I just wanted to show you a couple examples. Um, Here's another one. So you can see where, where the blue circles are. Those are areas that it's sort of iffy, you know, and it, and it looks as though 
the gingival tissue has sort of crept over the margin itself. This is that same image, except in the monochromatic, which actually looks worse in the monochromatic. And why I show you those is so that I can show you this. And yes, it is textbook, right? It's, um, but this is, you know, this, this is what the goal is. This is what we're trying to achieve. Um, and, and knowing that we need both um, apical and lateral retraction of the tissue, um, of the gingival tissue, so that the, the camera, right, so that the, the optical device can actually look in and capture all of that data. And there's multiple ways of accomplishing this. Um, my personal go-to is gonna be retraction cord, but there's paste and lasers and a few other things that we'll mention as well. But keep this one in the back of your head. This is, this is what our goal is. This is what we're always looking for. And here's some examples as to how to get there. So um, this is my personal favorite setup. Uh, so for me, uh, the gold standard for gingival tissue retraction and uh, maintaining a nice, clear, dry sulcus is going to be a dual cure, dual cord technique. So two cords. Uh, the first one I pack is gonna be a double zero. Uh, followed by, depending upon what the sulcus can accept, right, depending upon the periodontal condition of that patient. So it might be a zero, it might be a number one, it, it could be a number two. You know, if the decay went really deep and uh, you were able to, to get a nice little uh, chamfer, then uh, we, we want to use the largest size we can because that's what's going to push the uh, the, the gingival tissue away from the prep, and that is what's going to expose the margin so that we can pick that up with the camera. So retraction cord, this is just a kit that I, I grabbed a snapshot um, offline. I think it's, I, actually I think everything here is from a company by the name of Ultradent. Um, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, I believe um, Ultradent is a direct, uh, distributor so you have to order it directly versus like from Henry Schein or Patterson or Benko but um, I won't swear to that. So different sizes of retraction cord. Um, this is my particular favorite of uh, favorite packer. So it, it's going to have a, a curved um, head to it and it's going to be slightly serrated. Not real deep steps, not um, not super sharp, but enough so that you can sort of push and roll that cord into the sulcus and continue going around the circumference of the prep. And then there are many different hemostatic agents out there on the market. Um, one that I like is Viscostat. Viscostat comes in uh, regular Viscostat and Viscostat Clear. One of the reasons I like it is it has a little sponge applicator on the tip that you can um, you can like burnish it right into the gingival uh, tissue where where you have a little heme where that bleeding might be occurring. In addition um, to the cord or perhaps paste, uh, are a couple other items that we could use, right? Some people are, they absolutely hate cord. They don't want to have anything to do with cord. They've used it in the past. They've experienced, uh, you know, recession uh, down, down the line or some sort of uh, periodontal concerns. And, and I, I respect that. There's many ways to um, do many things in life. Uh, retraction paste can work very nicely. Also uh, referred to as foam cord or magic cord. Uh, but the, the, the trick with that is you really want to make sure that you take that fine tip here and get it right into the sulcus. You want to express the material directly into the sulcus um, because that's what's going to have it push the tissue away from the prepared tooth. Oftentimes people just squirt it in there on the gum tissue, right? and they think they're using it as a hemostatic agent. 
which it is also a hemostatic agent. But for it to retract the tissue, you need to express it directly into the sulcus itself. <coughs> Excuse me. So in combination with that, I like to use something called a compra cap. So this is a picture of the compra cap. And the compra cap, this is an image of what the packaging looks like and an image of the compra cap. So it, it's sort of um, contoured so that it goes a little deeper inter, interproximally um, and it just adds uh, some physical pressure to help uh, displace the cord or the retraction paste as well as stop the, uh, stop the bleeding. So you can use that in combination with a cord or in combination with paste. Um, what else, what else? Oh, uh, make sure that you follow the manufacturer's guidelines for the paste. Usually it's between two and five minutes. And it's really important to pay attention to that because sometimes if you wait too long, I say, oh, you know, doctor's gonna do a hygiene check and uh, we'll take care of it in 10 minutes. Well, it's lost its, um, it's lost its oomph. It's, it's starting to dissolve and, and uh, re retract or, you know, the opposite of retract. It's, it's starting to shrink uh, and lose its ability to, to act as a, as a tissue uh, retraction tool or method. So pay, pay close attention to uh, the times on retraction paste and be certain to really vigorously and thoroughly remove the paste itself. And I know, I know sometimes you don't want to because you're afraid that little little spot of uh, hem is going to start again if, if, you, uh, if you rinse too vigorously. But it's important to get all of the paste off of the prepared tooth. I can't tell you how many times I get called in to um, contact an office because the image that we got has like stuff all over the prep itself and it, it's retraction paste. So it's really important that we, um, that we rinse all of that off be, so as not to compromise the image itself. And so, you know, all of this is um, to ensure that we have a clean, dry field and uh, proper hemostasis prior to ever scanning. So there are additional methods, right? Lots of, lots of ways to accomplish uh, tissue retraction. Uh, what about a laser? Lots of offices have lasers now. Lasers can work wonderfully. Um, however, sometimes they don't. And, and I'm not certain if it's the device, if it's the laser itself, if it's the patient's tissue, or if it's perhaps user error. Uh, but sometimes you get a beautiful, nice, clean um, uh, tissue uh, around the prep, the, the margin is exposed beautifully, and other times it's all jagged and and ratty and it's sort of half bleeding and that's a mess. That's really difficult to get a scan around. Um, usually you have to go back and use some additional uh, method to control uh, the hemorrhaging. And uh, yeah, so be, be careful with that. Know, know your laser, I guess, and, and what you're working with. Uh, rotary curatage, not a fan. Um, I know there, there have been methods um, in the past, you know, the five minute prep and all these, all these different um, items when you're using the burr to actually cut away the gingival tissue. Um, and, and philosophically, some believe that it can, um, you know, foster good periodontal health. Uh, and, and perhaps it does. But when it comes to digitally scanning, it is usually a bloody mess. It's, it's really, really difficult to get good uh, hemostasis after using your burr to cut the tissue away. Uh, electrosurge. Electrosurge has been around forever. I'm gonna say, you know, similar to laser, but laser is better. 
Um, again, it, it can be used, um, especially if you have uh, decay that has gone very deeply, you know, at least it gets it cleaned up to the point that you can go back and use retraction paste with that. Um, I've also, I haven't used myself, but I have experienced people using Teflon tape, which I thought was, was really interesting. It doesn't, it doesn't do much for, um, as a hemostatic agent, of course, um, but it's firm enough that it pushed the tissue away and exposed that margin. So that, that was really awesome. And then I had an assistant not too long ago, pre-COVID, pre um, show me what she likes to do. And she takes some bite registration material, like blue bite material, and puts it just along the circumference of the prep, or I'm sorry, of her temporary, has the patient bite into the temporary, and that displaces the tissue. And boy, that worked really nicely as well. So I'm, I'm always interested in learning new methods. If any of our participants this evening has a helpful tip um, to share with me, I'm always thrilled to add it to the presentation. So a little bit about um, our, looking at the time here, a little bit about our um, training capabilities. So DSG is fortunate to have um, a team of trainers who are familiar with uh, multiple different scanner systems out there that we can assist you uh, on a more one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, to increase uh, your speed or your accuracy or to discuss um, and overcome different challenges that you're experiencing um, and to go over some of the items that I mentioned this evening in a more one-on-one -on -one, uh, atmosphere. Um, so one of the things that we are able to do in that one-on-one -on -one session is to remotely access your scanner itself. Uh, and we can do multiple things at that point. We could check your settings. We could check uh, if calibration is needed uh, with certain systems. Um, perhaps we want to assess previous scans that you've done um, and that the case perhaps did not go so well and you're interested in learning, hmm, is there something I could have done differently with my scan that would have had the outcome of the restoration gone a little better. Um, besides that, we can remotely access the scanner while you are scanning with an active patient. And that is a, a really, um, it's fun for us. It, it's a really neat uh, opportunity because it's like we're there with you. Um, and and we can provide some coaching. You know, it's, it needs to be a particular patient, right? Um, but it's a, it's, it's a really neat opportunity um, and an item that we are thrilled that we're able to support you with. It's, a, it's one of the things that we, we, we got good at um, during our COVID quarantine time, I guess. So what else here? Um, you know, bite registrations is a big one. We, we evaluate uh, bite registrations. And even if we can manipulate that bite to what we think is ideal and contact the dentist about that, um, we, we do that and we do that regularly. And this is a typical communication um, to an office where the bite registration was off. And so one of the things we can do is in um, most systems, you have an opportunity to retake a bite or uh, rescan a bite once a case has already been submitted, or how to best uh, check your bite before you submit the case to ensure it's accurate. That's, that's really super key. So these are just some of our accreditations. You know, our, our team um, consists of uh, certified trained trainers on a multitude of systems. Um, we have CDAs, CDTs, MDTs, RDAs. Um, we're, we're proud of the fact that we have dental professionals and experts working with you on your scanner needs. Um, we are not um, salespeople. 
trying to sell you something from the lab and oh by the way I, I can show you how to make sure my lab is on your scanner now I can make sure I, I can teach you or show you how to make sure our lab is on your scanner but there's uh, there's more substance to what we do and and I'm happy to share that with you this evening a little bit about our you know, workflow from a digital perspective. So any digital scans that come into the lab, this is an example of, uh, of our digital experience workflow. And so the, the scan comes in, right? Um, the, the file is managed or, or batched and, and put to certain folders depending upon what type of restoration is being prescribed. And in some cases, it's going to be modelless and uh, might be milled. And in other cases, a model is gonna be created and then a more traditional crown will be fabricated before being sent back um, to the doctor after going through final QC. So one of the nice things uh, with the modelless um, option is there's no models, right? And it provides an opportunity for a faster turnaround time. Uh, we're, we're more limited in what type of restoration can be done. So um, typically it's gonna be a full contour zirconia, um, one or two units at a time. And that's um, five days door to door. So if you send us a scan Monday before noon, we can have uh, the crown back to you um, Friday by noon. And this is uh, some of the DXC team. So uh, Chris uh, is operations manager. He runs the show there. Um, David Ringenberg is responsible for workflows. Um, Ashley is our um, consultant. Um, he, he's typically the person that is finding um, items or you know, opportunities for improvement. Um, but he's um, asking myself or Marissa Larson, who's uh, one of our clinical chairside trainers, to contact the office about and offer support. Um, I'm going to do. Whoop, I'm going to try to get this to work. Bear with me here, and I'm I'm being conscious of time, so I'm good there. This is a little video um, that shows you. We call it a day in the life of a DXC crown. And let's see if it'll work. It doesn't look like it. Shoot. Okay. Oh, here we go. It's our incoming quality control. This is a design. Final finishes. And that's it. So now let me see if I can get out of here, right? <clears throat> hmm. Great. Um, so I, we mentioned before that uh, we work with many different uh, scanners out there. And uh, there are specific sending instructions for each different scanner out there. So I, I'm gonna run through these real quick. So uh, like every single one of them has slightly different uh, descriptions and instructions and know that we know um, how to do it. So you can count on us for support with that. 
Uh, we're very proud of the service that we're able to provide, um, as well as technical support, you know, an educational program such as this evening. And uh, the one of the things that I think digital has really assisted us with is clearer communication. So the most of the uh, digital scanners will not allow you to completely send, submit the case, unless you've identified uh, the, the crown prep, you know, the tooth number, uh, the material selection, uh, the shade. So it, it's ensuring that all of those necessary items are identified in the prescription, the digital prescription before you send it. So that, that you know, makes our uh, collaborative work together. Uh, much more successful. And we also have um, a digital profile form, which allows us to have uh, personalized, your personalized preferences on file for us to check at uh, incoming and outgoing final QC. And then lastly, just something that's specific to DSG is our nightly case um, digest. It informs you when uh, cases are received and when they are shipping out as well. Just uh, know that we are excited to be able to provide uh, different webinars um, to you uh, and we're excited for the opportunity to provide a remote uh, training for you. In the event you wish to train something, you wish to schedule something, uh, personally as a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you can utilize the phone number on the screen as 800-511-7147 or digitalimpression at dentalservices.net. And that completes the presentation for this evening. I think we have um, 